So a very good evening from Singapore. I hope that everybody can hear me okay. My name is Chris Rudd. I am the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at James Cook uh, Singapore campus and I am delighted to welcome everybody to the seventh professorial lecture webinar and the final lecture of its series of 2020 about to be delivered by uh, our colleague Professor Karen West of which a little bit more in a moment. I just want to start with a few brief housekeeping announcements. First of all, to say that the webinar will be recorded for publicity purposes. Secondly, that we would encourage attendees to ask questions at any point of the webinar through the Q&A function that you can find on your main screen. Also that there will be a satisfaction poll and survey at the end of the webinar and we would encourage everyone to complete that and give us feedback on the, the content that you've enjoyed. And then if you've got any technical issues during the, the session, please use the chat button to communicate with the panelists and event organizers. So, so with that, let me present to you my esteemed colleague, Professor Karen West. Karen is the Dean of Research for JCU Singapore. And uh, on her shoulders, she carries the responsibility for establishing research in general, but most particularly the second pillar of research with our, within our Tropical Futures Institute, which, which focuses on healthy aging and associated non-communicable diseases in Singapore. And, Nobody is, is better placed to do that in that Karen is also a senior staff member in nursing and midwifery in the College of Healthcare Sciences. Karen is also deputy head of discipline and holds a number of administrative roles, in addition to her diverse research portfolio, of course, within nursing and public health. And through her professional roles and awards, including an early career fellowship, with the National Health and Medical Research Council and directorship of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for, for Nursing, Midwifery Education and Research Capacity Building. Professor West's areas of research include disaster management, which we're going to hear much more about this afternoon, nursing education and alcohol related injuries in Australian indigenous communities. Karen maintains a very strong international reputation working across Asia Pacific and Western Pacific countries. She is a current executive committee member for the Western Pacific region of the global network of WHO Collaborating Center for Nursing and Midwifery and a committee member and advisor for the Asia Pacific Emergency Disasters Nurses Network. So Karen brings a huge amount of experience and insight into her chosen topic today. And guessing from where Karen has lived and where she has operated, um, I'm guessing Karen that, that experience was not built by running simulations on Minecraft, but by running the hard yards out in some very difficult environments and we are delighted to welcome you here Karen and delighted to hear your insights this evening over to you thanks for that Chris and thank you to everybody for attending um, if we have time at the end I'll share with you the the small calamity that occurred just before um, this presentation but all is well um, okay so tonight we're going to talk about resilience in the face of disaster and what better uh, setting to sort of put this in is uh, the middle of a pandemic. Um, you know, so we, we're going to talk a little bit about the elephant in the globe uh, in this, but in to set the scene first, we're going to talk about disasters and, and what they are and how they function. So I've tried to really position this around Singapore so that it, it makes, um, I suppose, an emotional sense for want of a better, better word. Okay, now this is a, a, an unusual slide I know, 
But um, what's really important when we talk about any sort of disaster related work is that if it has, if, if tonight's presentation has any adverse effects on any of you, it's really important that you seek some help. Um, disasters are the things that are the types of things that affect us all very differently and for different lengths of time. So if tonight's presentation conjures up uh, any any sort of um, feelings that you need some help with, it's, really, it's incredibly important that you go and seek some help and JCU has a wonderful counselling service for staff and students. Okay, so quick overview. We'll have a look at some types of disasters, where we live and why it matters. And that's one of the, the critical, um, I suppose, parts of disaster mitigation and disaster planning is understanding where we live, why history matters. And we'll, get, we'll dig down into that a little bit. The ostrich effect, if there's any business colleagues in the room, I'm sure that you've heard of the term, the ostrich effect, but we'll, we'll talk about the, the humble ostrich a bit. Improving our preparedness, the perfect storm that is SARS-CoV-2 that we commonly know as COVID-19 and of course post-disaster implications and how, how to build resilience. Okay, so before we can talk about disasters, we need to understand what they are. So by definition, a disaster is a sudden calamitous event that seriously disrupts the functioning of a community or society and causes human, material, and economic or environmental losses that exceed the community or society's ability to cope using its own resources. Though often caused by nature, disasters can have human origins. Now, if we have a look at sort of the classif classification and categories on this slide, by default, we go to natural disasters. So things like typhoons and hurricanes, wildfires, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, and so forth. But on the other side are some of the major man-made uh, disasters that have happened in more recent times. And of course, 9-11 was one of the largest of those. Uh, some of the, the big sea oil tanker um, explosions. And of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So SARS-CoV-2 is a, is a man-made disaster. So let's have a look at some quick numbers. This was uh, this is real time data. Um, I took this uh, yesterday off um, the the global disaster site. So you can see that across the world, there are multiple disaster events occurring at any given stage. So there's droughts and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. I think when I took this, there was a a couple of tropical cyclones or hurricanes, depending on what part of the country or what, what side of the hemisphere, uh, the equator they were on. But if we look at some quick numbers, in 2019, 308 disasters were triggered, were triggered by nation, uh, natural hazards, and those disasters affected 97.6 million people worldwide. And from that, 24, just under 25, thousand people lost their lives. In the first six months of COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, over 100 disasters occurred, affecting over 50 million people. Since more, um, since more focused measurement of disasters um, came about in the 1960s, so we started to count what happened about by about the mid 1960s, we, we noticed that the climate and weather related disasters began to increase. And since the 1990s, that number of um, natural disasters has increased about 35%. So what we know is that as time goes on, disasters are becoming more frequent and often more powerful. And you know, there's, there's a number of reasons why this could happen. Some people link it to climate change, some people link it to the ozone and so forth. Um, but again, that's a, a completely separate presentation, I think. Okay, so let's take this data and let's bring it a little bit closer to home. Surrounding Singapore, uh, so Singapore is the, the little tiny dot uh, there, the little red dot. Do you, um, surrounding Singapore are a number of highly intensive disaster sites, including the Ring of Fire in Merapi, um, uh, really oh, in Indo Indonesia. And to give you a little bit of uh, context, the Ring of Fire or the, 
circumpacific belt is a path along the Pacific Ocean and it's characterized by active volcanoes and frequent earthquakes and it, it's approximately 40,000 kilometers uh, long and traces seven tectonic plates. Um, what's important, I suppose, about this area is that it's home to 75% of the Earth's volcanoes and more than 450 vol volcanoes are located within that ring of fire and they, they trigger 90% of the Earth's earthquakes. And although it might seem like it's a long way away, the distance between Indonesia and Singapore is approximately 1,200 kilometres, which in the grand scheme of things is really not that far. Okay, so let's have a look at Singapore and some of the disasters. So can a, can a tsunami hit Singapore? What do you think? I, I can't actually see the comments or Q&A, Chris, so if anyone has an answer to any of these questions, I'm not likely to know. So technically, Singapore is surrounded by water, uh, so it could be affected by a tsunami, but the most likely scenario to cause that would be a, a megathrust earthquake in the ring of fire. So 1200 kilometers away, if there was a megathrust earthquake where one of the tectonic plates is forced underneath the other, rupturing the fault boundary and deforming the upper plate, the resulting tsunami like the one that hit the Indian Ocean in 2004 could affect Singapore, but it's not likely to because the Indonesian archipelago acts as a barrier that protects Singapore from events like tsunamis and is situated beautifully between Indonesia and the Ring of Fire where they're likely to happen and Singapore. So it's, it's a little like the Great Barrier Reef that protects the northern parts of Australia. So earthquakes, why aren't there any earthquakes in Singapore? Well. That one's a, a pretty a pretty easy one. Singapore, Singapore is not located on a plate boundary, so therefore it's not prone to, to earthquakes. Um, this is due to the overall tectonics of the region, and as we said sort of earlier, all of the activity is pretty much around Indonesia. So you you will feel the impact of an earthquake, especially if it's a mega thrust, um, because that's going to really affect the whole Chandra self, um, shelf and the continental shelf but it's not likely to uh, trigger anything in Singapore. So what about hurricanes or tropical cyclones? Can anyone tell me the difference first between a typhoon, a hurricane and a tropical cyclone? No, we got anything Chris? We, we, we still got a blank on the on the feed okay. current. That's all right. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll tell you the answer. Hurricanes are tropical storms that form over the North Atlantic Ocean and the Northwest Pacific Oceans. Cyclones are, called, are the same thing, but they're formed over the South Pacific and Indian Oceans, and typhoons are formed over the Northwest Pacific Ocean. So the chances of a hurricane or cyclone hitting is very, very low due to a couple of things. And the first is the Coriolis effect. So I'm sure that most of you have heard about the Coriolis effect. So the way the earth rotates from uh, west to east or, or counterclockwise, if we view it from the, the North Pole, this rotation causes uh, fluids, you know, such as ocean water, lakes and whatnot, and, and droplets in the air and the currents to be deflected to the right in the Northern hemisphere and to the left in the Southern hemisphere. So cyclones can, can form in areas of any low pressure. Really, it's just a difference in geography as to the difference in the name, but they are, they're all the same thing. So the other thing that protects Singapore really is its geographical location. So Singapore lies 1.5 degrees north of the equator, and it's almost sort of squarely between the first and second parallels. And if we bring this back to the Coriolis effect, and you can remember back to your physics day, the Coriolis force at the equator is zero, uh, meaning that no area of low pressure is likely to exist there. Henceforth, no cyclones in Singapore. In saying that, there was a tropical cyclone that hit Singapore once. And that was, well, in, in most recent times, that was at about 8.30 in the morning on December the 27th. And that was Typhoon Vami, uh, and it made landfall approximately 60 kilometers northeast of Singapore. 
Um, and given that this event is um, such a rare thing, uh, scientists have, have sort of said it's likely to only ever happen once every few hundred years. And there's no previous recorded uh, tropical cyclone or hurricane or typhoon that I could find that had um, hit Singapore. So we move on to volcanoes. So volcanoes, what do we think? Nope, no volcanoes because you don't have any volcanoes. So you're not likely to get a volcanic eruption. As far as drought goes, Singapore is actually considered to be one of the most drought stressed countries in the world and is heavily uh, reliant on its annual rainfall, just pretty much due to the lack of natural water resources and, and its limitations in land. Uh, makes water storage facilities quite difficult to do on mass. So prolonged dry spells uh, can threaten water uh, can threaten and cause water shortages in Singapore. And the most recent one of those water shortages was in the 1990s. If we go now to wildfires, very low. Uh, you do have quite a bit of green space, but the amount of rain that you get really negates the effect of, of wildfires occurring in, Indonesia, uh, in Singapore. But you do actually get influenced and by smog from the Indonesian wildfires, uh, and that can cause smog and haze in Singapore. So like we said, even though it's 1,200 kilometres away, uh, really, that's not much in the grand, grand scheme of distance. And lastly, for natural disasters, we're going to talk about floods. So each year, you know, of course, various parts of Singapore are inundated by a series of floods, uh, usually in the form of flash floods that come about due to the monsoonal rains. And in and Singapore, like parts of northern Australia, you get a lot of rainfall in a very short period of time. However, Singapore actually fares much better than a, a lot of your Asian neighbours uh, like Thailand and Indonesia and China because of the flood mitigation factors that have been been put in but I'm sure if you were the owners of any of these vehicles you might um, disagree that that Singapore actually has quite robust mitigation factors for flood. Okay so let's have a look at some man-made disasters and and we refer to man-made disasters as anthropogenic hazards so um, really we're, what we're talking about is hazards caused by human action or inaction and that's really important um, because it's not always what we do, it's sometimes what we don't do. And look, some of the most obvious examples in, in this category are the Great Wars. You know, wars are considered to be um, a, a natural disaster and they're a man-made disaster. So World War I, World War II, uh, Chernobyl was the world's worst nuclear power accident, 9-11, uh, going back a little bit, the Great Smog of London, all man-made. So my question to you is, what do you think Singapore's greatest man-made potential threat could be? And I'm, I'm guessing that the picture on my slide has given it away. So if we look um, at Singapore's Changi Airport in, 19, in 2018, it was listed as the 19th of 20 of the busiest airports in the world and had about 60, 65 and a half million passengers uh, go through its doors, seven and a half odd thousand flights a week and 400 city connections. So if we look at a scenario such as an air traffic accident, uh, cyber attacks, which are in increasing and chemical and bio, uh, biological warfare, um, it, it makes sense that the Achilles heel of Singapore is possibly Changi Airport. So, Normally, a standard re response here is uh, when I when I do this in in any country is to say, well, yeah, but we've got great detection services in place and we've got really high security and and yes, you do you do. Changi is one of the the safest airports in the world and sets incredibly high standards for itself as far as protection wise goes, and that's that's really important because that's part of a mitigation strategy. But still, it's a global hub with millions of foot traffic daily. So it may not be at risk of being a ground zero, but it could certainly be a part of a chain. And with biological warfare as the emerging threat of the 21st century, we often in disaster space, we refer to it as the poor man's atom bomb. Um, biological agents like anthrax, are probably one of the easiest bioweapons um, that, that can be unleashed on an unsuspecting public. 
uh, and it's relatively easy and safe to to handle anthrax. You know, there's there's quite a bunch of it around. It lives in the dirt. Um, as long as you know, it, it has a long shelf life, which is also handy for a biological weapon. Um, and all you really need to do is make a device that can deliver widespread aerosol of the anthrax spores, and and that what that's what makes it um, really really viable as as a as an agent and a biological weapon. Um, the other thing too is the the spores, as long as they're kept out of sunlight and kept dry, they can remain viable for over a hundred years. So it, it's really, I suppose, tempting to say that nobody in their right mind would ever do something like this. But my response to that is, not everybody is in their right mind all of the time. Okay, so. We'll talk more specifically about SARS-CoV-2 a little later in the presentation. But, you know, I was talking to some colleagues today and I said what COVID-19 has highlighted beautifully is how simple viruses, simple cell viruses such as SARS in 2003, H1N1 in 2009, uh, the MERS virus in 2012 and now COVID-19 can cripple communities and create economic chaos that far outweighs any single natural disaster and the financial impact associated with it to date. So, you know, they, they may, I suppose, be less common, but they're certainly there. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about why history matters. And, and for me, this is one of the, the critical parts of, of the presentations that we do. So when we apply history to anything, the foundational assumptions uh, that change just doesn't happen, change is made. So understanding the context of a region, a culture, religion, um, even the history is necessary to predicting the impact on the population and the surrounding environment. By assigning history to a disaster, we can create a story that's complex, yet intrinsically detailed, intricately detailed, and we can pinpoint moments and decisions where things might have been different decisions that were made that put people in danger and contingencies that were put into place aimed at creating stability within the chaos and that possibly saved lives. But most importantly, what we're doing is we're creating a map that ensures change in the future. In most cases, when we look at disasters through a historical lens, poor outcomes are not due to cosmic bad luck or divine retribution, but they're the product of of human history and human decisions. What history does well is help us find precedents to make sense of the now and identify the successes and failures of the past and the lessons that we've got let to, year, to learn. Importantly about history, we can't control the disaster, but we can certainly control how we respond to it. Okay, so, if I was to ask you how disaster ready you are, I wonder what your response would be. I imagine it would be more ready than you were in January of this year. <coughs> Excuse me. There are some things that we know for certain about disasters and successful outcomes. Communities that are connected know how and when to prepare and to access contemporary information. They're able to make informed decisions in the chaotic and changing environment which provides them with the ability to react and respond to the situation at hand. In addition, connected communities are more adept at creating their own solutions, resulting in social cohesion, which leads to proactive protection against the loss of assets, livelihood, shelter, and creates a sense of security and well-being, which again accelerates the ability to recover. So when we're pre preparing for a disaster, Protecting key infrastructure helps preserve the health and welfare of all those involved, which collectively increases resilience. This is a superpower. So this, this cohesion and, and ability to um, preserve is a superpower that I believe Singapore has, which is why the response to the current pandemic has been so successful. And especially at JCU Singapore, you've been able to increase student numbers and continue the teaching. Okay, so let's talk about ostriches for a little while. 
people often wonder why I use this slide, but hopefully it's going to make a bit of sense soon. And again, I don't know if there's any business people present, present tonight, but it, this is actually a really old business term um, that we've borrowed for want of a better word and put into the disaster space. So what do we know about the humble ostrich? Well, pretty much this guy gets a pretty poor rap when it comes to facing its fears and mitigating risk. We wrongly assume that when things get chaotic or there's an impending threat that the ostrich sticks its head in the sand and pretends that nothing's happening. Well, fun facts, he may do a lot of stuff, but hiding in his, his head in the sand is not one of them. In, rea in reality, ostriches are actually very proactive and when they're threatened, they have three main strategies. They can run away and they're pretty fast. They can stay and fight. And if you've ever seen an ostrich's uh, feet, they, they kick out a pretty good boot. Or they can try and hide and they do that by lying flat on the ground with their long necks sticking out and their head down. And what this does is it actually is a really useful mitigation strategy because it makes them look like a mound of grass and the predator tends to just wander on by. So for humankind, the idea of somebody hiding their head in the sand like an ostrich is actually an ancient metaphor and it's applied to situations where people foolishly ignore their problems while hopingly, hoping that they're gonna magically vanish. In financial cir circles, acting in a similar way where money is concerned is referred to as the ostrich effect and describes a safety mechanism whereby people treat risky situations uh, to do with finance by pretending they don't exist and often they have disastrous uh, outcomes. But as far as the disaster space goes, in, in 2017, Meyer and Kruntha adopted the ostrich effect uh, theory to disasters with the aim of addressing two key assumptions. And the first was why humans are so poor at dealing with disastrous risks and what we can do about it. So I had some questions, I'm gonna ask them, but um, that's okay, I'll answer them. My second question to you is why do you think it is that people are confronted, that when, when we're confronted with high consequence, low probability event decisions, that the outcomes go disastrously wrong for us. And for those that are into quiz shows, the number one response by those surveyed was, it won't happen to me. Now, how many times have you said to yourself this about something? You know, it's not gonna happen to me. And I suppose my, my next question to you would be, why not? Why, why wouldn't it happen to you? What's so special or different about you that makes you protected from bad stuff? Because the truth of it is bad stuff happens to good people all of the time. Yet we're surprised when disaster strikes, even if we know it's coming. So when we look at the ostrich effect, it's predominantly experienced by people who have never had a situation happen to them before. And they use that fact that because the event has never happened to them, it is justification for their belief that it never will happen. And that's just not the case. And I think, you know, with this, importantly, this, this foolish ignorance or, or arrogance can happen at any level. It can happen from the poor man on the street to the highest level government officials. Local government agencies might be unprepared to handle disasters if the analytics provided to them um, cause them to underestimate the, the potential risks. Hospitals may make inadequate preparations in terms of emergency supplies for food, medication, um, staff to have on, even if they're warned of a potential disaster. You know, people may make inadequate preparations for their homes, their businesses, their families, their possessions, just because a disaster's never happened to them or never happened in Singapore. So therefore they assume that it's not likely to happen. You know, and, and in essence, it's these actions or, or biases which lead individuals and communities and institutions to make some really grave errors that cost lives in disaster situations. Okay. So this is what Myron and Crumper proposed as the risk of why humans are so poor at de dealing with disaster at risks. And they've come up with the six biases of the wildly unprepared. And the first one is myopia. So that's short-sightedness, not understanding the long-term effects, effects of things. Amnesia is a tendency to quickly forget 
what's happened in the past. So not understanding history or bothering to look. Optimism, understanding the probability of risks. So again, hashtag it won't happen to me. Inertia, maintaining current practices. If we haven't prepared in the past, we're probably not likely to prepare in the future. Simplification, not looking for all of the information. You know, just somebody said this, so therefore that's what I believe. And of course, the last one is hurting. We look to others as a general rule to make decisions for us or to guide us. So when we look at those as a list, they don't really make much sense. So I thought we could quickly work through an example of the ostrich effect that I think explains it really quite well. So I've called this history repeating itself and it happened in Galveston, Texas. So in Galveston, Texas on the 8th of September, 1900, the people of Galveston had no idea that a disaster was about to come and, and, and before them, they didn't have mobile phones. They, you know, they certainly didn't have the internet. There was a thickening of clouds. Um, the surf had started to rise. It suggested that there was a storm, but few people were worried. They just went about their day. The local weather office didn't issue any urgent warnings. There were no calls to evacuate. And by the late afternoon, hurricane forced winds of more than 100 miles an hour were raking the city and a massive ocean storm surge um, came up and, and people then tried to flee, but it was too late by then. In 1900 in Galveston, Texan, Texas, more than 8,000 people died on that day, which is the greatest loss of life from a natural disaster in US history. So let's fast forward to September 2008, Galveston, Texas, Hurricane Ike threatened the same coastline, but this time the population was well informed. Technology had improved, had mobile phones, had the internet, people had a lot of stuff. Um, Hurricane Ike had been under constant surveillance by satellites, aircrafts and land-based radar systems for more than a week. And the news was blasting non-stop reports and warnings urging people in the coastal areas to leave. After the 1900 storm, a 17 foot high seawall had been constructed and it stood ready to protect the city. And the government um, issued flood insurance policies for those that wanted them that were at risk of property loss. Suffice to say, unlike the people in 1900, the 2008 residents of Galveston really should have had very little to worry about and very little reason to be afraid. They had a century of advances in meteorology, engineering, economics, and to ensure that cyclone Hurricane Ike would pass by just like another summer storm. But the storm intensified, warnings to evacuate were issued, and many people ignored them, even when they were told that if they failed to heed the warning, they would face certain death. Galveston's aging seawall was breached in multiple places, causing damage to 80% of the homes and the businesses in the city. The resort communities to the north fared worse and were almost completely destroyed. Among the thousands of homeowners who suffered flood loss, only 39% of them had seen fit to purchase flood insurance. In the end, Hurricane, Hurricane Ike caused more than $14 billion worth of property damage and over 100 deaths, almost all of which were needless. Okay, so our ability to foresee and protect against catastrophic, catastrophic events has increased dramatically, but it's done precious little to reduce the material losses and impacts associated with disastrous events. Uh, there's a gap between the protective technology we have developed and the protective action that we illustrate, which loops us back nicely to earlier in the conversation where we identified that connected communities are more adept at creating their own solutions and the resulting social cohesion promotes proactive protection against loss, which in turn accelerates the ability to recover. In 2015, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction was released and it was made very clear in that paper that an action oriented approach to disaster mitigation was key and that the responsibility for ensuring that action occurred was no longer solely in the hands of governments and emergency services, but every single person in the community because connectedness within a community and responsibility increases resilience and increases the successful outcome. 
Okay, so if we look at any disaster event, whether it's man-made or natural, there are certain impacts that occur that we know quite a bit about. And firstly, we have a tendency to measure loss in financial terms, loss of infrastructure, work hours, shock, um, sorry, um, stock, crops, and, and these are all the nuts and bolts of a functioning community. So of course they're really important, but what's not often calculated within these costs are the human impacts. So people's vulnerability will vary as a result of class, gender, ethnic, identity, age, and experience. Financial and political vulnerability will alter in the post-disaster period, and people's emotions, social, and psychological status will fluctuate. All of these things will change depending on the extent of an individual's actual loss and their perception of loss. So in order for a community to, to properly recover, we need to understand the vulnerabilities of the population in the immediate post-period, post-disaster period, and then for a critical 12 to 24 months after that. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the emotional realities here. And if we look at this slide, we can see the impact of emotional loss experienced over an 18 month period due to a disaster. And really regardless of the disaster, this is a trajectory that is common for many, many people. As a global populace, we're, we're nearly at the one year anniversary of the first discussions around COVID-19 and, and first sort of identifications that this was a virus that, that could spread rapidly. And in the early days, remember, there were phrases like, this will be over soon. We just have to get a vaccine. It's just like the seasonal flu. And yet here we are, you know, um, not only is it nearly a year, but the second wave was larger than the first. Um, and more damaging, and the waves keep coming, and we don't have a proven vaccine. You know, we talk more about, we'll talk more about vaccines later, um, and I think then some of my esteemed colleagues are going to jump in with some of their ideas and, and slides, so they told me earlier, so we'll see. Okay, let's have a look at some, some impacts of how that emotional roller coaster can manifest itself into real life. So this slide shows emotional behavior and social interactions of children who survived the 2011 Japan triple disaster. And what it shows really clearly is that many of the impacts lasted well over two and a half years and resulted in a, a total difficulty score um, consistently well above normal expected behaviors in children of this age. Um, you know, th this data set is just one of a specific cohort of children, but we know that there are similar, similar trajectories in adults, uh, which trigger or exacerbate numerous other behaviours. Some of those markers that we can track um, and, and monitor post-major life events are antidepressant usage tends to increase quite significantly uh, for a period of 12 to 18 months, suicide and self-harm incidents increase, domestic violence increases, violence against children, alcohol and drug, uh, other drug intake. Uh, geographical movement is, is great in the area, so people tend to move away from that space. Business closures, falls in school grades, and so on. And importantly, these, um, these effects are across the board. People, you know, it, it's not just one specific age group predominantly. People who experience minor proper damage, property damage and resource loss are just as likely as an individual who experience, experiences major loss to exhibit acute stress disorder symptoms. Where we see differences are uh, in the, the people in the hardest hit, and these people are significantly more likely to report at least one or more symptoms of acute stress disorder, coupled with an ongoing psychological distress status. And compound, compounding this, we also know that individuals who are exposed to multiple or repeated traumas are likely to uh, exhibit more severe responses than those that don't um, are um, associated to multiple traumas. So look, we also know that not everyone is the same and, and how individuals are going to react, react and for how long is going to vary. So commonly though, people exhibit acute stress disorders in four areas. So in the essence of time, I'm not gonna linger on these slides, um, but I just want you to have a think as I go through them, if you've experienced any of these things or, or people that you know in the last year. Okay, so uh, the previous slide 
we had up was behavioural, this is cognitive. Um, and we, we, we need to know that the important thing about emotional um, symptoms is that it's very normal to feel sad, to be in shock and to be angry and so on. These are very, very normal emotions after a disaster. It's when those feelings are prolonged that we need to start to get concerned about long-term psych psychological effects. Uh, cognitive, I'm sorry, I said that in the, in the wrong order before. So things like poor concentration, uh, forgetting things, flashbacks, and then of course, we've got some behavioral symptoms. Uh, sleep disturbance, disturbances are very common. Um, Short-tempered conflict within the family, um, crying and tearfulness and things like that. Okay, so cracking on the perfect storm. So no, now we're back and we are back with this elephant on the globe. And why is COVID-19 called the perfect storm? You know, look, other respiratory infectious pathogens have led to worldwide outbreaks that have seriously endangered human health. And for example, you know, by the end of 2009, the H1N1 flu ep epidemic peaked in most countries with about 70,000 laboratory confirmed hospitalized patients and over two and a half thousand fatal cases observed in 19 countries. If we look at the Spanish flu, um, the world's population in 1918 was around 2.5 billion, and it's estimated that about 500 million people were affected by the Spanish flu, so roughly 20% of the world's population. Up to 50 million people died from the Spanish flu, so about 10% of those infected actually passed away. Young adults were especially vulnerable um, to the Spanish flu and, and people aged between 20 and 40 were um, certainly made up large numbers of the deaths. And we wonder now looking back at that, if it's because older people had a partial immunity to um, past exposures and other strains of flu viruses that they seem to fare much better. But remember in 1918, you know, you, you couldn't go and get an annual flu jab um, and you weren't also flying around the world uh, and, and traveling as extensively as we, we are today. So as of about half an hour ago, the worldwide total cumulative count of COVID cases was sitting at 69,260,257. And on average, two, 202 people per million population per day are dying. So that's 1.5 and a, a little bit of spare change people so far have lost their lives um, to COVID-19 and not a country on the planet has been left untouched. But if we look at those two things, we're not really comparing apples with apples. So hot off the heels of the Spanish flu in 1918 and World War I, which was 1914 to 1918, came a global comparable, comparable event. And I had a question of any takers, but I'm sure that you're going to know it was the Great Depression. You know, and that began in 1929 and it lasted until about 1933 and again affected virtually every country of the world. And as with every disaster, the, the, the dates and the magnitude of the downturn varied substantially from country to country. So what's so unique about these events is that they've touched all the hallmarks that we use to define what we call a society. Okay, so... The economy in both examples has been impacted. Um, here alone, the loss of tourism, declined in a decline in international students, trade agreements that have uh, led to job losses as businesses and companies have been forced to shut their doors. For a country like Singapore, tourism um, spending results in a movement of money from one area to another and the creation of um, many, many jobs. You know, and it's a strategy to foster economic de development and growth in regions that um, may have little other scope for developing, developing, uh, development in, in other areas. So we just have to look at the global travel industry alone. And it's predicted that from COVID-19, 120 million job loss, uh, jobs are at risk with an economic damage likely to exceed a trillion dollars. The other thing that these two um, were Globally, governing bodies have made decisions that for some have resulted in probably um, not the best of outcomes. And, and what that does is it shakes people's confidence in a system as a whole. You know, other countries have slammed shut their borders and, 
and that creates a we're going to protect us and it's it creates an us and them type of environment um and it's it's really become a game of survival you know but in every crisis situation constant change of leadership or ineffective leaders is really damning for for positive outcomes in in a in the situation and again i'm going to link this back to singapore you know there's this there's this stability um within your political system that says look we're here the government spoke quickly they spoke truthfully and they've kept a constant um supply of message messages going through that people look to as the truth so that's incredibly important uh when it comes to successful outcomes Again, we have social implications in both of these events. Enforced or prolonged isolation have had major implications for many during this pandemic. The inability to share time and space with those we love, the uncertainty, the fear, the loneliness, the death rates have all resulted in some of the most horrific statistics being referred to as the echo effect and and we'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, and in addition, there's been this great loss in social capital. So those wonderful moments of contact with human beings that we actually need on a daily basis, and and more so during a disaster, we need those interactions, and yet they've been taken away or stifled. So for the citizens of the world, very few have not been touched by the effects of COVID-19, and as yet, there are some vaccines, but no pro proven cure. Okay, so um, given the news out of the UK, I, I feel really obliged to talk about some of the vaccines and their imminent release, but this is a whole presentation that could be done uh, by, by somebody with much more knowledge in this space than me. Uh, so I don't really want to dwell on it, but you know, the, the big movers at the moment are, of course, UK's Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, um, which has been uh, commenced. Uh, and it, it, its use has been commenced under the emergency use authorization in the UK, and it's pitched to have a 95% efficacy rate. Uh, Russia's answer to COVID-19 is called Sputnik V, and it claims also to have a 95% protection against coronavirus. And of course, there's numerous others um, in the wings that are coming out of Poland and Brazil and uh, certainly Australia as well. But the release of the Pfizer-BioNTech product, from what I understand, is it's not really a traditional vaccine in that it doesn't prevent you from getting the virus, but rather it prevents the nastiest symptoms of the virus. So that means that you can still get the virus and pass it on to others. Um, you know, and if you are vaccinated, you may not know that you have it, but you still have the ability to then shed viral particles um, or, or virus particles, they, they're called virons, as you move about. You know, so the way this vaccine works is it's a, it's a two-shot approach with the second shot to try and attain some sort of immunity. Um, and the first shot really is to decrease the severity of, of some of the major symptoms of COVID-19. And the gap between the trial, you know, they, the gap between the injections, they're going to make it a month, but in, in trial stage, it was 19 to about 42 days, they varied it. Um, and the active ingredient in this is a messenger RNA. So what it does is they inject this messenger RNA into a fat uh, molecule, really, and it carries instructions to make the virus uh, spike protein which it can then use to gain entry into cells. And once it's in the cells, the hope is that because it's a foreign body, your body will build antibodies to it and try and fight it off. Hence, you need two doses of it. So because the vaccine is um, oh, in the, the messenger RNA in this is synthetic. So it's not actually extracted from a, a, the COVID-19 virus. So as far as knowing whether immunity is going to occur, we don't really know. That's not something that they tested in the initial trials of this drug. You know, so I suppose the questions this raises for me is because of the emergency use authorization and the rapid rollout, how do we actually test efficacy and reliability? Because normally in this space, what we would use as the gold standard is a clinical trial. But for that to happen, 50% of the population has to receive a placebo, so a, a dummy drug. And that's not likely to occur in a pandemic. So for countries like Singapore and Australia, we actually benefit by being able to sit back and watch what happens, both good and bad, uh, when large populations such as the UK and Europe are mass vaccinated. And 
due to the very nature of unfriendly pathogenic organisms that you know seek to invade us we tend to look for an answer in a hurry you know what we need to understand is when we're creating vaccines and and vaccines aren't created very often in the, in the grand scheme of things but what we need to understand is that rarely is that race a sprint it's more like a, a marathon but in the case of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 it's more like an ultra marathon um, with some extra hurdles thrown in just for good measure. Sometimes though, finding a vaccine is a battle that we can't win. And, and I think that needs to be a reality for, for people to understand. We know from reports at the time that the Spanish flu just didn't disappear and there was certainly no vaccine. Um, you know, the in influenza virus that is the basis of it and, and it was a H1N1 virus, continually mutated, um, passing through humans and pigs and other mammals, you know, until the pandemic virus morphed into just another seasonal flu. So if you think about it this way, the, the seasonal flus that we fight today are actually descendants of the 1918 H1N1 virus that we call Spanish flu. <coughs> okay, we're nearly there. Um, I just wanted to show this slide um, because I mentioned before the, the echo, echo effect that's coming our way, which we refer to as a mental health tsunami. You know, and at the moment, physical, um, physical health and economic crisis are pretty much top of the discussion list, but there's a rapidly rising tide of mental health concerns globally that are going to need uh, addressing and, and soon. This is a result of the perfect storm that we talked about. So all of those factors, the reality of unemployment for people, Employment offers job satisfaction for, for most of us. And in, in many cases, it gives us a sense of purpose as well as an income. So without employment, people lose their sense of purpose, which leads to a sense of self, uh, a loss of self-respect and can result in depression, anxiety, anger, fear, and so on. The impact of loneliness and social isolation, especially for elderly people who may be cut off and, uh, physically from friends and family, uh, you know, loneliness can exacerbate any predisposing um, depression or, or mental health illness that you may have. Um, and having to isolate with people that you're close to can flare up sort of unpleasant tensions in, in many ways. And, and stresses are put on family units, you know, or the people that are, are living together in houses which can cause domestic violence, exacerbate violence that exists. Um, and, and magnify a number of the conditions. And for children, this can be really frightening. Uh, it's, it's really hard for young minds to get a grasp on the reality of what COVID-19 is. And children of, you know, uh, at risk of becoming upset and frightened, asking about possible deaths of themselves or family or loved ones. You know, we often don't think of homeless people. You know, the, these people are often a group that already have mental health conditions and they're faced with the difficulties of not having a home or being put into close confines with people that they don't know. Um, and, and often being near other people who might also have a mental illness can trigger a bunch of things. So um, look, and then there's this, this atmosphere of fear and uncertainty. And you know, who's a carrier? Who should we fear? Who should we shun? When's the end date of this gonna come? And all of these factors are conflicting and intensified by this blanket media coverage that increases all of our stresses and the result is a rising, a rapidly rising tide or mental, of mental distress and mental health issues. You know, and I, I just want, these are very recent um, graphs. I had, to, I had to choose them quickly uh, of a study that was done in Japan and it was only published last month. And you can see the, the rise and especially the rise in female um, uh, suicides in Japan when they compare 2020, so now in 2020 with 2017 and 2019 numbers. I'm so close to the end, guys. Um, look, I, I found this slide today and I just wanted to put it up because one, it, it reinforced my girls in Texas, Texas uh, example, but these are the COVID figures from last Thursday, last Wednesday, last Tuesday and last Friday in the United States. So for the whole country, not one specific state. And it shows the magnitude of COVID-19 when compared against other major events. 
Okay, so what are we going to do about this? First, we need to have robust mitigation plans in place. And these are the, the actions that we take every day in relation to our families, our friends, our colleagues and our loved ones, and they can make a real difference. And again, this is something that JCU Singapore has taken an absolute stellar lead on. You know, we, we need to ensure that people are valued and that they have a sense of purpose and that they have the correct information and that they're heard. Um, you know, we, we need to understand the effect, the the effects of events like this across all areas, not just the financial implications. And we need to be acutely aware that not everyone is going to respond to a crisis as we do, and we need to actually be okay with that. And if we loop back to the beginning of this presentation, we need to learn the lessons of history that are on offer and ensure that we apply them whilst constantly performing risk assessments so that we can change our practice. Okay, so um, I think we can all agree that COVID-19 has not only fully arrived, but it's not gonna go anywhere for a while. Um, but how bad it gets from this point forward will largely be a function of how our society responds and on every level. You know, as we said earlier, the general consensus is that a resilient community adds to overall disaster response and recovery. And, and we're able to recover from disaster situations quickly, function well under stress, proactively protect themselves and successfully adapt to changing conditions. And Singapore has done a wonderful job at present, preventing this disease from gaining a strong foothold, which demonstrates the difference that action can make. Um, and I won't compare you to other countries, but I think you get the picture. You know, and I believe that JCU Singapore has also done a wonderful job at responding to the risk and caring for each and every member of its community. Um, you know, but, if we don't continue to be smart here, what happens next will because of, be because of the steps that we take rather than the virus itself. Okay, so as we've said, the tenants of a resilient society are actually very simple and the responsibility lies within each and every one of us. There's not one person, not, not one person has the ability to be resilient all of the time. It's, it's not a possibility. Resilience is this wonderful fluid state. It ebbs and flows. However, the sum of the parts is actually greater than the whole. And what that means is that together, we have a greater chance of being successful. You know, in, in my opinion, um, and it is just my opinion, I, I believe that the COVID-19 pandemic was entirely foreseeable. Uh, yet by refusing to take that threat seriously, the risk and the impact have expanded globally. You know, and, and either way, we're no longer at the beginning, you know, we're here. And whether it's a pandemic, whether it's climate change, an earthquake, our future will include massive catastrophes like this. But in a world that has technical, technological capabilities like ours means that we can mitigate those disasters through preparation and resilience or we can make them worse. You know, I, I say often that Singapore is strategically positioned to be a leader in the post-pandemic space in a number of areas. And I, I believe this to be true, um, but to be that leader, we need to plan and act now. You know, we, we need to identify the vulnerabilities, we need to learn the lessons, and we need to, to learn them in order to make the solutions for the future. And on that note, I will Thank you all and stay safe, wash your hands, and we welcome in 2021 in the very near future. Uh, Karen, many, many thanks for that. There's a, a great deal of admiration coming in for uh, your insights on, on the chat and uh, individuals expressing uh, the wish to get in touch with you to discuss further some of the, the topics that you've raised. Um, I, I know that you're, you're dying to get some input from the um, GCU Singapore uh, Vaccines Think Tank, um, but 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 before we get su sucked down the the rabbit hole of of COVID nineteen, I just want to uh, expose you to a couple of the the broader questions which have come in, which I think are very interesting. Um, in particular. Um, Jonathan Ramsey from uh, psychology here in Singapore uh, notes that, um, you know, from a psychologist's point of view, it's a very interesting problem because disasters are so big and scary, as John says, that people find it very difficult to connect their individual 
decisions and actions with 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 meaningful outcomes and and that the feelings of individual powerlessness can give rise to collective inaction and and so the question from john is how can we help people to see the connection between their individual actions and beneficial outcomes for society thanks john that's a really good question um because in the past we did it quite well in you know if we look back at um you know communities i suppose when when we were uh, less tech savvy for for want of a better word we were connected we would we would talk more we we knew who our neighbors were and we had time to interact yet in our technological advances and and again this is my I, i'm not a psychologist this is this is my opinion i think we have advanced technologically incredibly quickly we haven't advanced or evolved as emotionally quickly in that space so we have all of this wonderful stuff but we haven't adapted emotionally to be able to temper ourselves um, and and set limitations so that we have a happy balance between all of the really good stuff that we've got and the connections that we had in the past and and i think it, it could be as simple as that um, you know putting putting down one of these and having a conversation how many times do you see people all see families out for dinner and everyone's on their phone um, and they'll say yeah we eat together every night but in reality they don't and i think um, japanese history has something valuable to add here I, I don't remember the term in japanese but it says do one thing at a time and do it well um, you know and and that i think is an important lesson for all of us so i'm happy to talk to you further about it john karen there's a lot of people asking essentially different variants of the same question which is you know what about the lack of preparedness from from governments that ought to have known better um dean jerry is is raising the issue was you know is the exceptionalism you know it can't happen to me more prominent in developed countries than, than developing countries um why and again dean asking why why we haven't retained the lessons from the spanish flu why <coughs> indeed why trump closed down the the pandemic task force six months yeah. before you know, <coughs> at the end of, of 2019. And, and then just related to that, then Nigel asking, how can resilience be learned and developed in, in people, in communities, without them actually having these cathartic experiences? Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll address the, the Trump question first, um, and I'm going to just answer that with, who knows why a lot of things happened in that space. So that's where we'll park that. You know, uh, the United States uh, really were, were leaders in this space um, and they certainly uh, had um, a, a very good disaster mitigation plan in place, but that was that was lost soon after the presidency changed. So, you know, I'm, I'm not there. I, it's not really my space to comment on, but it's been a very interesting res response from the United States, but also from another a number of other um, countries around the world. The president of Brazil the other day said um, under no circumstances would he ever take a vaccine um, because it's it's against human rights. Well, you know, I think we could argue too that, um, you know, put, putting an entire country at, at risk that costs lives to this extent has happened in the past and, and we've referred to that as, as genocide. Uh, so I think that there will be some questions raised of political leaders once we're through this. And, and look, you know, I've, I've every confidence that this, this time too will pass. You know, as, as far as um, why, why haven't we learned the, the history lessons of the past? Look, we don't, they don't do that at all. You know, I, I spend most of my disaster space arguing that if you spend a dollar now in mitigation, you will save 10 to 15 after the effect. Yet it is seen as a waste of money or a poor use of money because what if it doesn't happen? You know, what what if this, you know, it's 100 years before the last pandemic like the Spanish flu to now, we've had smaller ones, we've managed to contain them. But if we, if we go back even to when SARS and H1N1 were around, again, the advances that we've made technologically in the last five, 10, 15, 20 years have been massive. And with that, 
comes, I think, probably a, a, an arrogance that we're, we're bulletproof. You know, med medicine's going to help us. We're going to fix this. And sometimes the world needs a little reminder that um, we're not all that and we, we need to sit up and pay attention and, and be a little bit responsible for what we do and the way we do it. Uh, and I can't remember the third question that was in that. Sorry, Chris. You're on mute. The third one, Karen, was the point from Nigel, which is about how can you embed resilience, preparedness and anticipation in, in education programs and community engagement yeah. so that it becomes embedded. Yeah. I, I wonder if this is a, a trick question from Nigel. So uh, when, when we talk about resilience, there's pretty much two fairly strong camps. The, the McCubbins and McCubbins say that resilience is something that you're born with. It's like hardiness. You either have it or you don't. Um, and then there's, there's the Walsh camp. So from a Walsh uh, is an American and she believes that resilience can be learned. And I, I sit firmly in the resilience can be learned and taught uh, camp. I think that um, there, there are a number of skills that we can do to increase the resilience of people and populations. You know, they say to change a generation, we need to change change the, the youngest generation and then it becomes not a new thing, it becomes the, the norm. Um, you know, if, if we talk natural disasters, you know, oh, we wrote a three day workshop um, called um, Resilient Communities in Disasters. And it, it was really well, had a, had a really great uptake because people aren't silly. You know, the, the general public um, are often treated on, on mass as, you know, being a bit dopey and they're not gonna understand it. So, well, we're just gonna do it for them and then we'll tell them what to do. So we perpetuate that hurting, you know, we, we perpetuate the don't give them enough information. We catastrophize things whenever there is a disaster. You know, killer storm is coming. You know, the flood of a century. The the this the by the hand of God, whatever. You know, and it and it creates an element of of fear and and catastrophe where there is no need to do that. But that's what sells newspapers, for for want of a better term. Um, there's there's a some critical things that we can do just with with our children and if you look at the cycles of society um you know and and i'm not getting into the when i was a kid or when when chris was a kid you know but but we did things naturally that allowed us to build resilience you know you you rode bikes without a helmet you you had a skateboard that you tried to drive down a hill you caught the local horse and jumped on its back you swam in a creek and and it came with stories and encouragement and controls put on on you by your, your parents and generally we survived these things but we certainly learned what not to do through um, trial and error and you could come home you could have those stories you could you could share that interaction in that space so i, I think partly resilience is is learned and built at home but it's also done through the experiences that we encounter every day. Not everyone's a winner in life. Not everyone's going to get a medal. And if you don't get a medal, you need to understand why and, and, and be okay with it and, and pick yourself up and go off and have another crack and, and train a bit harder next time. Um, I, I think we've created swathes of the mess that we are in. Not all of it, but a large part. Karen, I'll, I'm going to broaden it out a little bit just before we come back to the, the vaccines think tank. Um, so Denise has asked another one of those clever psychology questions, which is about the fact that you've got acute events like earthquake and tsunami uh, and, and um, long term, you know, 12 month, 18 month catastrophes like, like COVID. Um, they may, you know, stepping back, have similar outcomes in terms of economic impact, loss of life, and all of that. But, but what about the the qualitative differences between community response to them, individual response to them, because of the sort of, I suppose it's the boiling a frog effect. Yeah. Um, any comment there? Yeah. Look, and you know, when when I put up that um, the graph of sort of the emotional implications over an eighteen month period. What we, what we know is that prolonged effect events, so things like this pandemic, 
um, any of the great wars, any any the the Afghan war, you know, wars in the Middle East that have been been going on for years now. The longer the event, um, the worse the implications are for a larger amount of the populace. But you know, the the acute stress disorders for most of the people uh, after whether it be a short term event or a long term event will will fade um, relatively quickly it's acute it's, it means by definition that it's short term you will have a percentage of the population where it continues over to sort of a, um, a medium stress or anxiety event and then of course you can have a, 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 a smaller again section of that population that will end up with a PTSD so a post-traumatic stress disorder and often manifest itself with some sort of psychological ongoing um, condition as well on the whole they tend to be relatively small um, groups of the populace that that will go uh, into that long-term trajectory most people will be able to i don't like the term bounce back uh, but most people will be able to reassume uh, a, a normal life and are generally more resilient than we give them credit for you know we, with resilience people say well you, you know you bounce back well you don't bounce back nothing bounces back if you drop a ball it never quite gets back to where it is and the way i like to look at it is you don't need to go through something horrific in order to be a better person nobody needs to learn the lesson of a pandemic or a virus or a cyclone or an earthquake that's not what we need but if we do we need to be able to get to a space where we can not just survive it survivors aren't necessarily resilience resilient people they just put one foot in front of the other we need to be able to function in our society live well and love well and they're the two bits about resilience that for me are, are critical you you need to be able to live well and love well post the event that's happened but really the, the reaction is surprisingly very similar um with short term because it's about actual loss and perceived loss you know and you you might you've, your house might burn down you know and you might think oh well i didn't like anything in it it doesn't matter i've got enough money to build another one yet somebody else who lost a photo album it could be the end of their world because the loss to them was perceived as great karen that is a, a fantastic segue into what is going to be the final question that we've got time for it's from Louise Phillips, who, who asks specifically about the role of the arts in disaster recovery, I suppose, as a, as a therapeutic medium or as a means by which a community could contextualise that disaster within their own local history and, and whether you've had any personal experience of that or any insights? Absolutely, I have. And um, so... <laughs> We, we ran this, we, we wrote and we run a, a, a short program. One is for, for nurses and healthcare workers, but specifically for undergraduate uh, nurses and undergraduate medical students. And it's a three-day workshop called Resilient Communities in Disaster. And we took those four tenets of sort of knowledge and, and connection and security, and we, we built the workshop around those things. Um, and then... You know, we, we upskill them with things like, uh, you know, psychological first aid and, and disaster first aid. And we, we run great scenarios and we've got moulage kits so we can make the most, my team here make the most wonderful gaping wounds of sticks sticking out of people's chests and whatnot. Um, but we also readapted it for the community, for the local Indigenous communities in Cape York. And it's we run it very, very differently because we run it in a way that will make sense um, to, to the people and it reflects the damages that, um, that they have, or that they're likely to experience. Um, and a part of that process is we always get a space in the community and it's called putting your fingerprint on it. So they're, but they paint their hands and it becomes wall art and they design a logo to go with it. They become um, a local hero and it's, it's incredible to see the change within the community because making it into a form of art means it becomes their story. It, it sits in a storytelling world and we are very much a, um, an oral society in a lot of ways. So there's, there's great impact in art and in not only recovery and, and history keeping, 
um, but as a means of bringing a community together. So yeah, I think it's got a, a great space. Go forth and, and bring in the arts. Thanks, Karen. I, I think that's uh, a lovely note to end on. You've, you've chosen uh, a broad and, and complex topic, but, but you've addressed it in a, a wonderfully accessible way. But I think one that is clearly, you know, based on the discussion of the last 10 minutes or so, has reached out to lots of different discipline areas and, and you know, provoke people to think about how they can use their own disciplinary expertise to contribute to what is an ongoing problem. And it's something which clearly is never going to go away. But um, we're talking, I suppose, about mitigation, anticipation, education, and and recovery. Yep. So, so, so many thanks for that. Many thanks to all of our attendees. Um, I, I launched the satisfaction poll a little bit earlier. I don't know whether you can see it, Karen, but you're you're, uh, you're currently polling at a hundred percent, which. Um, which seems like not a, not, a, not a bad place to to end on. So so thanks for giving up your your evening and hey, everybody welcome. thanks for for dialing in. Um, if this represents the start of your winter or summer break, respectively, I I hope that you have a, a safe and uh, enjoyous time with with your friends and families. And I hope that everybody stays safe and look forward to rejoining the eighth professorial lecture in early 2021. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thanks everyone.